All right, you guys, this is Ross the Fig Boss. In today's video, we are inside to start. I'm gonna be outside in just a minute. Uh, the reason for that is because I wanna update you guys on a whole range of different topics. And uh, we are, you know, unfortunately have not been covering videos for you guys in a very timely manner. A lot of the videos that come out are like a month or two, something that I had filmed a month or two ago. So I figured in this video, we would cover a whole host of different things like hoshigaki or dried persimmons. We'll talk about the persimmon trees outside. I wanna show you even, I think briefly, the pomegranates out there. We'll talk about the figs. Maybe we'll look at the greenhouse. Uh, I wanna talk about lignification of figs. I wanna talk about uh, a thank you because I had, um, you know, had a very successful season this year in terms of our sales that we had, whether that was from cuttings, whether that was from our trees that we bare rooted. I've been very happy and I've been uh, using that money to really put it towards this channel. The first thing we'll talk about is the hoshigaki, these dried persimmons. It's really, I think, one of nature's best creations here. It's amazing that nature has created something like this. These are some of the best treats that you can eat, especially you know, in terms of just dried fruit. I think it's the best dried fruit, at least for a temperate climate. These are so amazing when they dry, these Hychia persimmons. It's just so simple too. They dry so well, you just peel off the skin off of a Hychia persimmon or any persimmon that you want. Preferably, they should be the astringent types. I think the Fuyus don't do well like this. Um, so just peel off the skin and then put them in a, you know, a drier environment, like 40% humidity or lower. I have them just in this room with the fan blasting and you know it's not even warm in here it's comfortable right now but at night this room you know gets pretty cold so you really just have to pay attention to that humidity and I I bought a lot of those persimmons so you know I wish I had enough on my own trees to really just um, buy as many as I could or have as many as I could to dry them I wish I had hundreds of them but I just don't um, so until that happens, I'm going to keep buying those persimmons because they're just so amazing. Um, it's such a nice treat and it's really easy to do. You know, this will be my third year actually drying them into that, that state. Um, I did want to thank you guys, seriously, give you guys a huge thank you for all the support that, uh, you've all given me. There's so many people who bought cuttings this year as there is every year, really. Uh, but the support was really something, you know, and I tried to really make things a bit more professional for everybody. And I even included these, uh, these cards in every package. I hope you guys got this, uh, in your order because I fear that some of you guys may have threw out the package and may not even have known that this was in there, but this is a nice little thank you on the front. And then on the back actually has some handling instructions and storage instructions and further you know, information and things like that. The packaging went so well with these larger bags. Uh, the bare rooted trees went so well. Um, you know, I spent a lot of money to increase the value of, of what you guys are getting. And uh, I think it, uh, I think it paid off, you know. Um, we'll see, I guess, when you guys actually root the cuttings because, you know, people pay too much attention to what the cuttings look like and how they're wrapped and how they're packaged rather than how they actually root. But, you know, that's, uh, that's at least what people want. So that's what I was willing to do. The trees, I can't tell you, so many people are getting a huge treat with that. I've realized, especially, you know, more and more you think about it, how much money and time went into those trees is insane, you know. Uh, so I know there's another guy, Pete at Fig Life. He has another YouTube channel. He's doing the same thing. I know Fruit Nut was, was even catching on as well and doing a similar thing with his, some of his trees. So, you know, it's a wonderful thing, I think, these bare-rooted trees, to grow them out for a number of years. You get them over to people cheaply. They just take off. I just want to thank you guys so, so much. Uh, I've been very happy. And right now I'm a little sick, believe it or not. I'm not feeling too great. But I've been so happy. And, and a portion of the money that I've been you know, making off of these sales is going right back into this channel. And you can see actually on the lens of the camera, there's no spot anymore on the camera. So I bought myself a new lens and uh, it should be a nicer lens too, for I can zoom in a little bit better. It should be a little bit clearer. 
it's just an overall better lens for what I think I'm trying to do. The prior lens had a scratch on it. You guys thought there was a mark on it and I needed to clean it, but it's been like that for, for I think years maybe now at this point. Uh, and it was just about time that I get a new lens. I also bought a GoPro. And this is gonna be something very interesting that we'll do this year. I hope it works out. I hope people like these videos. I think it's gonna be my favorite thing, my favorite way of doing this. Attaching the GoPro to my chest. And the nice thing about this new one, the Hero 10, or at least the newer models, the stabilization on them is really good. You don't need a really steady hand or a stabilizer to use these things, I think, and not give you guys like motion sickness. So um, this will just attach to my chest. And then I'm gonna be doing actual work out there, having hands to actually do stuff and you guys will actually get to see firsthand the actual work that I do. I don't know, I can't think of a better way to learn um, you know, what exactly goes into all this. You know? uh, there's so much value, I think, in that, personally. Um, so let me go take you guys outside. It's about time, it's getting a little dark. I wanted to make sure I get out here before I can't get any sunlight. So a lot of the trees, the potted trees over here, we've got some air layers over here and different things that I've put up into larger pots that we, we cut the air layers a little bit earlier when we were bare rooting our trees. Sold a lot of the air layers, sold a lot, actually quite a few of the five gallon size pots, the varieties in these trees. We have a huge amount of rootstock for next year. I did a lot of trimming. In terms of really just cleaning things up, actual pruning, this year was bare minimum. I'm gonna put out a video, I think hopefully, on pruning these very soon, because that's critical. But uh, we have good varieties, I think, going forward, but what's even nicer is I have like a bunch of rootstock lined up. Like this one here is a Black Beauty 10. I have this one here, which I thought about selling, but I said, you know what? I'd rather just have it as a rootstock and maybe someone you know, wouldn't really uh, kind of value the tree as much or the variety as much. Here's another rootstock. We have a ton of rootstock and I've kind of just been piling these up or keeping them in, the, in place because very soon they're gonna go underneath the sunroom. It's, you know, like as I said, December 10th, but you really haven't seen anything below 20 yet or even like 25, I think. It's been so mild. I'm just shocked um, that there's no real rush because I would like to see something below 20, at least 25, and that's maybe what I'm gonna have to do. The forecast coming up is showing 25 uh, one night. And I guess at that point, maybe I'll just wrap it up because we still have a lot of the in-ground trees, as you can see, some of them have already been bent over. And they may look like I chopped them or something, which I did do a lot of pruning, but you can see I just bent this over, stuck one of these garden staples in the ground, and it stapled the whole thing here to the ground. Very soon, I just throw the tarps over top. As soon as I bend them all over, some of these are a little bit more difficult, I've realized, like the thicker the wood is on some of these varieties, the more difficult it is for it to stay in place but you know, it'll eventually, it'll work itself out. Maybe I can weigh some of the, the trunks down with bricks or something like these, these pink bricks that I have uh, all over the yard. Um, I could also think about staking them with really small cuts of stake, uh, stakes and then tying them down to the stake. There's many options and I'm not gonna even put down straw this year. We're gonna very simply just throw tarps over top. I think that's enough. With the heat of the ground, and if I can keep the outer edges of the tarp, you know, nice and snug, I think we trap enough of that heat in. Um, and we should be good getting them through, you know, something like zero degrees. So that's gotta happen really around the same time as these trees go away. So I have like one day's worth of work left where I put all these trees away, even these younger ones, by the way, uh, I'm still waiting for the cold. And some people may think, oh, Ross, these trees are so young. Why have you still left them out here, you know? But first off, I've actually keep them extremely dry. They've been underneath these greenhouses. I haven't watered them in a very long time. 
and I want to keep the soil a bit dry and then I want to water them in once. So maybe a rain that comes in, I may have to hand water them. But once I water them, uh, then they go away for good underneath the sunroom. And I should even mulch the top of the pots. Uh, same thing with the rest of these pots. You gotta mulch them really well. And that way you don't really have to water them all winter. They just sit there in that relatively humid root cellar that I have right here and I'm good. You know, if your environment's really dry, then you might want to think otherwise. Uh, something interesting right here is I dug up a lot of root stocks. These are suckers from trees that I don't really use for fruit. I use them for grafting and I just put them here into this, this pot. Here's some other suckers or air layers or different things that I've ripped up. This is a really large air layer here that I will put into a five gallon size pot in the spring. I'd rather keep them in smaller pots now. Um, we didn't do any pruning, really. I think I did almost none on these potted trees. And you might think, well, these trees are just too high. I'm gonna have to probably put some of them on their side, bend some of the branches in the uh, storage, which I'm not, I'm not a f uh, against. Because when I come out here in the spring, put all the trees back in their place or where they should be, then I just stake these branches and I stake them in their proper spot so they can get the most amount of sunlight possible. Uh, that's really critical. The pomegranates, by the way, just quickly, they're asleep. I thought actually this one here, red silk, had died, but it didn't. Very late in the season, it finally leafed out. I would say a good portion of this tree is probably dead, but that's why you see so much green on this tree, which is not good. I don't know what's gonna happen to this one, but the rest of these are dormant. They're gonna stay out here for quite some time, just like these other fig trees. As soon as I see like 20, 25, I mean, I'm probably just gonna have to rush it this year because it's been so mild. It's just been so weird. And I don't wanna have to one day come out here and just, you know, break my back to, uh, to do that, the longer I wait, the potential there is, more potential there is for a, a temperature below 15. You know, 15 would be fine. Actually, 15 would be perfect. But the lower we get, the worse it is, I think. Um, what else did I want to show you? So a lot of the trees, by the way, the figs, we're going to bend them. I still have maybe a little bit of pruning left, actually, on some of these smaller trees that I didn't want to sell cuttings from. Uh, so we'll do some pruning on that, bend the rest of them over, throw the tarps over top. You can see these here though are very small, just like how we've been doing the last two winters. Cut them back to six to 12 inches because this portion here in the front will have a low tunnel over top in the spring. These back portions, because the trees are so big, you can't throw a low tunnel over that. You know, so there's a big difference and I have to, there's a video that I need to put out discussing all of this, the specifics of that, that we filmed a while ago and why I'm doing this, but that's how it's going to work this year, uh, is that all of the trees other than this section will have a low tunnel. So I'll do a very small experiment with the tunnels, get that ironed out, all the kinks that are involved in that as we had struggled this season with it. I also have younger fig trees over here that we planted, just very, very small. And you know, the goal and the hope is that I'm not gonna be here forever. I'm gonna be moving hopefully in May. That's the, the goal, but I figured why not just plant them, uh, even if I leave them here for a season, come back when I have more time, I can always dig these up and plant them at the new property. You know, it's not like uh, this would be a huge problem to plant them. Uh, it's going to be a more of a problem when I have to dig things up like this Gumi uh, when they're just giant plants with giant root systems. And, you know, I imagine some of these plants I'm going to have to probably kill. I may have to just chop them all the way down to the base. Um, but yeah, I, in terms of my persimmons, really quickly, we have the celebrity right here. That's proc. And then I also have, uh, this is a Sejo right here that's very small. I have an Akita's gift over there that's extremely small. So we've been grafting and trying new varieties um, because what I'm finding as I taste more of these persimmons 
really ripen them myself is that I really like the astringent types that are of American descent, have American genetics, because the Asian persimmons are a bit more bland, watered down flavor, whereas Proc is so amazing. That is an incredibly good persimmon. It has that dried fruit flavor, that date flavor in it. It's just amazing. The Celebrity, I thought, also was amazing for different reasons regarding flavor. And so far, Rosianca is only number three, which uh, was surprising to me because I didn't think you'd get better than that. Um, the greenhouse, we put the cover on today. I went out here this morning. I realized I don't want the sun shining in here, and I want the colder temperature still to hit these trees. I already put these away. These are the trees that need a head start for the winter. At least those are the trees I think need a head start for the winter or the larger pots that I have, the larger trees that I have. One of them is already touching the top in multiple positions, so I may have to prune that. I'm not sure, but you know, these I just put away earlier, a couple days ago, and I figured it'd be a good idea to uh, put the cover on top because I don't want it getting too hot, too warm in there. I want them to stay cold. That's critical. All you guys with these fig trees you're putting away, you got to keep them between 20 and 45 degrees Fahrenheit all winter. It's, you know, my average last frost is May 1st. So around April 1st, I can start getting a little creative and get things a little bit warmer, which it typically does starting in like March 15th. So, you know, you don't really want to have the heat any earlier than a month or a month and a half before your, fro your average last frost. We actually still have a lot of air layers on these trees as well, most of which I'm, I'm leaving here. We air layered a lot this year. Um, a lot of the Ron de Bardos took really well. Some of the others, I think for a very interesting reason, didn't air layer very well. You know, like this here is medieval Yavor. And you can see there is roots there, but not many. It doesn't fill up the whole bag. And I didn't want to take air layers until they were really ready to be taken. The White Marseille, I think, does well every year. Ron de Bardot did really well this year. Um, so what I'm thinking is, it really is the light. And it comes down to, I think, the light that reaches the bottoms of the trees. Um, I don't know what it is, I guess. It's just if there's energy down there or light down there, then the tree puts energy towards the bottom. Otherwise, most of that's towards the top. And because of the Ronde de Bordeaux, I mean, you could see actually the, sh the spreading habit of this was getting a lot of light because of that spreading habit. And the center was open and all the air layers took and did extremely well. Whereas most of the others, because this was so shaded, did not. Whereas this actually wasn't shaded either. And it really brings up other points about some fruit drop that I was witnessing as well this year, where the fruit drop uh, was occurring on specific varieties, specific trees that some people report will drop and some people report that they don't. And I think really the only difference with the fruit drop is, um, you know, how much light those fruits are actually reaching. So if I had a fruit, yeah, let me just show you real quick. If I'm looking at, you know, this tree here as an example, and the fruits were way down here, as they re-sprout from that base, they grow, and as they grow, they fruit. Um, this whole section of the branch was getting quite shaded because this whole thing was a dense canopy of branches, with this high dense system. And some varieties like Celeste is a really important one and uh, St. Martin is another one, Pastelier is another one. I think those three very specifically need way more light on the fruits as they continue to ripen than any of the other varieties by far. So I may, that theory may only apply to some varieties. Uh, it's amazing I think why some people have fruit drop on Celeste and others don't. You know, why, does, why is that happening? People immediately think about soil moisture. I got more moisture in my soil than I need. And that's not the problem. Um, so my only theory and thought process, knowing what I know about light now, it's gotta be about the light. 
Um, and I've noticed this for consecutive years now. So this will be interesting to see how the light comes into this area now that we thinned every tree to one trunk, bending these over, uh, and then springing them back up in the, in the spring. How is this gonna take up this, this area? I know I wanna spread these out, these trunks. I didn't wanna cut this whole thing. I wanted to leave a little bit of extra wood just in case um, you know, there is a lot of dieback on the tips or something, uh, whatever the case may be. Um, and then I can spread out these limbs with stakes and different things. I, get, I, think, that, I think really what's just going to happen is that this is just the same thing, but at a higher level. The other difference is that it doesn't have to re-sprout from the base. It, you know, it has all that energy already built in especially if these tips are preserved. That would be absolutely critical, best case scenario. My hope, as I've been thinking more about this, I hope you guys can hear me because that microphone may have just got messed up with my leg there. Um, as, I was show as I noticed over here with, uh, first off, this little ruby, it didn't just grow like a big lanky thing. You know, it did branch out and put out this nice growth, preserving those tips. Um, whereas if I had really cut these trees way back, you would see huge growth, um, very lanky, long limbs that would create this very dense canopy. But I think doing it like this, preserving the tips like that, I think it, it isn't so bad. The same thing can be said over here for this Texas BA-1 is that the tree really, I mean, I pruned out the middle, but the tree really didn't put out this crazy growth. It put out these nice long or shortened branches and you know, it didn't fruit because this variety is just a pain in the butt and needs a lot of light. But it just goes to show you, I think, how much you prune the tree and how then it responds the following year. Um, so it'll be a nice learning experience to see especially because I haven't had too many trees in the past where we preserved all of the wood throughout the winter. You know, always I've done some sort of pruning. Um, you know, I've rarely have wrapped the trees either. So this will be a good, interesting observation that I'm gonna make this year. And then lastly, we have the Rosianca persimmon that I wanted to touch on. And uh, I'm gonna do its own separate video on this tree, but you can see those small orange globes there on the back side of the tree. What's interesting, this side here gets the most light. You know, this tree here was, wasn't really as tall as it was in the beginning of the season, and the sun comes right over here and then comes this way. So the whole back of the tree, you don't even really get a lot of light, you know? Um, which I thought was going to be a big issue with setting the fruits, or I should say not dropping the fruits, as it is very similar, I guess, with persimmon fruit drop. You could say the same thing about fig drop, is that if the fruits on the trees, after they're pollinated, don't get enough sunlight, the tree will just reject the fruits. You know, um, it makes total sense to me, right? So what's weird, though, is the total opposite of my theory had occurred, where on the shadier parts of the tree, actually the fruits held. And on the sunnier part of the tree, the fruits didn't hold. So I'm beyond confused with these persimmons. I don't know what to do. I am like, feel lost when it comes to pruning, I'm getting a little, uh, a little bit upset about it because as we showed you guys in the beginning, I mean, that's like an amazing treat. Very soon, I'll be able to harvest the rest of them. I've probably harvested a little over 10 or so. As they are starting to dry up now, they are losing their astringency. These are just incredible little globes of, uh, of goodness. I don't know how else to describe it. The nectar of the gods, right? Isn't that uh, what they call this thing? So for me... This is just an amazing fruit. Let's see how this lens zooms in, because this is one of the key things 
Oh, okay. So is it on autofocus? It's on manual focus. Well, I'm going to have to take it off that at some other point, but you get the idea. Not the largest fruit, but extremely tasty. Let me see you just real quick. If I zoom in on these fruits over here with the manual, see how this works out. The nice thing, because every lens has a different zoom in distance. And others can zoom out a lot further. So that looks pretty good. I mean, I wish I could zoom in more and have that focus that I want. I guess I have to find it. I don't even know how this works, guys. Manual focus is just difficult, but isn't it weird how like this branch over here has got all the fruit on it? It really is just this one branch too, which is so weird. It goes back into here. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's a sign of like which branches I should cut out or something. <laughs> I don't know. What's so different about this scaffold or Look at the many scaffolds I have in here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Something like that, nine or 10. I don't know. Anyway, so that was this video here, guys. I hope you uh, enjoyed the update. We gotta do a lot of pruning at some point with, uh, with that tree. I don't wanna keep the top so high and uh, Looking forward to it. Actually, I really enjoy pruning. I hope you guys do as well. Thanks for getting to the end. We'll see you soon, all right? Hit that subscribe button. Catch you guys for the next video. Take care.